I want to thank our panelists, Meb, Rick, and Rob uh, today for sharing some of their insight, which will help us all as running retailers keep our runners healthy. So just a quick bio on folks here. So Rob DeFilippis from New Jersey has owned Runner's High since 2001, is a USATF coach, and also has coached at the high school and collegiate level. My good friend Rick Muir here, who's a young 60 years old, Rick has coached over 22,000 runners to complete marathons, including over 10,000 Boston marathoners. It, there has, if there is a Guinness record, that probably is it. <laughs> and he's 60 and he's training for 100 mile races. So he's a, a good example of staying well and healthy into your years. And probably the, you know, the best example that we all know in the world right now is Meb Kaplesky, who just finished his professional career at the 2017 <laughs> New York City Marathon. Yeah, so that's a true privilege to have Meb here, and he's going to share um, some of his insight also after a movie which is going to be showing tonight at 5. But a couple of things about Meb I didn't know and, until I just read up a little bit today. So he's the only runner to win an Olympic medal, a New York City and Boston Marathon championship. Um, he's the oldest U.S. Olympic marathoner of all time. And he's co-authored a book called Meb for Mortals, which is really his secrets of 20 years of elite running. So he'll share some of that with you today. A little of my background, why I'm here asking these guys questions. I'm a physician by training. I'm a family physician at West Virginia University, but I also own a small running retail store in uh, Ranson, West Virginia. And I have a couple of my team here. So in kind of aligned with Greg's talk, you know, this is my passion and joy, and this is what really gives me positivity is this crowd. You know, when you work in hospitals every day, it's hard to keep that three to one positive to negative ratio going. So that's a little bit of why I'm here. But why, um, what we're gonna talk about here today is so we're all kind of under, right now, stress from internet markets, you know, free returns, free shipping, and we have to differentiate ourselves as retailers to do better. So what is our special niche? And that, that special niche is really that customer service that we give to people. I got a text message yesterday from a customer who was glowing about, you know, she posted it on my Facebook page. She came into the store. One of my ladies fit her with shoes, checked her gait, left with a shoe that made her feet and her body feel great. And, you know, that made my day right there. So just that personal touch. Now, one of the markets that I think we're starting to lose, and unfortunately, people are getting hurt, and runners are leaving the sport and activity, and we're starting to see declines after the age 45 of runners. So we need to come up with innovative ways to keep them in the sport and to keep them coming into your store. So how can you differentiate as a running retailer to keep people running for longer? Because obviously, that's going to increase your business. And there might also be some products that can help facilitate that, that can help them with cross-training. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. So on that line, how we're going to do this, I'm going to ask just a few questions to the panel. But I want to keep this really informal and allow you all to ans ask whatever questions you have for any of the panelists. And we'll probably stop about 5 of 5, but anything on your mind may not even be specifically with this, this topic. We have three experts here in running, so please ask away. But my first question that I'll just pose to the group, and they're all mic'd up, so I'll have each of them give their thoughts on this, but how can runners minimize the risk of injury to continue to perform well as they age? You know, maybe we'll start with Rob. Put me on the spot first, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I think with the technology of the shoes and everything ever evolving and obviously we could stand up here and talk about soft surfaces and minimal shoes and maximal shoes and things like that. But I think, you know, with the purpose of the topic today and where we've come with technology and things like that, it's, you know, tremendous to talk about an elliptical or a zero runner where there's no impact on that on the body and it allows you to recover pretty quickly and I can speak from my own experience at 46 having had back surgery five years ago I can't go out and necessarily run a 20 miler anymore but since we've been carrying the elliptical product you know I can go out and take the elliptical out and go knock off 15 20 25 miles if I want something different than the road bike um, and it's you know just a great way to get back into doing things you're outdoors doing the activities um, 
So I, I think that's one of the big ways, and as a retailer in the industry, it's a great way to get other customers in the store. And you know, you see those people that come in on a basis and say, oh, I can't run anymore, my knees are shot or my hips are shot. But you can see it in their face that they just miss it and they want to get back and have an outlet or an activity to it. So I think this is a perfect example with things like this, with giving people that opportunity again to do some of those things. Before I get, Meb, get Meb's thoughts, I'm just going to share a short story. I met Meb 2015, no, 2016 Air Force Marathon. So I got to hang out with Meb before heading out for 26 miles. And Meb, I think, was doing a 10K and then probably going out and doing his own run. But as I'm coming in that marathon, I was suffering a little bit coming in. And, and I was thinking of, gosh, I got to, like, talk to Meb at the finish. So I got to finish this thing strong. <laughs> so I, I finished the race OK. And I want everyone to, to do this with me because it's late in the day. So I cross the finish line, and everyone kind of stand up for a minute. All right, and now you're going to drop to the floor and give me five push-ups, OK? <laughs> Better do it, I guess. <laughs> All right. One, two, three, four, five. All right. All right. <laughs> OK, maybe that's part of what keeps me up strong. <clears throat> and I was able to get back up. <laughs> that was painful five push-ups. But, you know, so Meb, what are, you know, you watch not just with your own body, but you train with high-level runners too, you know, beyond just the recreational runners. What are some of the things that you've seen people do, you know, from around the world to keep them? You have 20 years of elite running in the sport, which is rare. Most people are done by age 30. Well, thank you, and uh, great to be here. Who did not do the push-ups? Raise your hand. <laughs> OK, more you people did it, so I'm glad. <laughs> um, that push-up started because of a real finish. I, you know, I stopped seven times, and at the end, I slipped and fell. And I'm like, really, from that finish line, I'm like, are you kidding me? And I dragged myself to the finish line, and I did the push-ups to just let the people know in the audience that I was OK. And then literally, I realized that by me dragging myself to the chest of the finish line, but my timing chips were behind me, so it cost me about four or five seconds probably. But <laughs> so that's the humor in that. But no, it's just uh, I think doing the small things that makes the big difference. As Rob alluded to, the, for me, it's been the elliptical for many years uh, because instead of doing the evening runs, uh, as an elite athlete, we train twice a week, I uh, mean, twice a day, and those four or five mile run in the afternoon, I'd rather go 20 mile on elliptical versus trying to minimize the risk of injuries, the impact, and also <clears throat> for the recovery for the next day. So soft surface, cross training, and rest. Because you, as you alluded to, 45 years older or older that, you become almost like an elite athlete. You have to take care of your body. It's an investment that you are making. If you don't invest on your body or in, in training and then cross training or maybe even a little bit of drills or icing or physical therapy, then you're going to hate it because if you get injured, the recovery, speeding of the, the recovery of the injury is going to be extra long. Therefore, you're not going to come back faster, so you're going to be in trouble. So as an elite athlete, we have to invest in our body. And as we get older, we have to do the same thing. So I think. The best way to do it is just listen to your body. If you say, oh, my Achilles sore, or my hamstring, or my IT, if you're touching it, your body and the mind is not together on the same page. So you'd rather take one day off than take a whole week off, or two weeks off, or never get to the starting line. So that's a, the best advice I can give. And I'll pass it on to Rick, who's coached 22,000 people. So when folks come to you early in a season, you know, what, what do you tell them? And I don't know how you would feel about following Meb, <laughs> but I, I hope you'll listen to me just for a moment. Uh, being 60 years old and injury-free and loving running, I, I said at lunch today, I love running uh, today as much as I ever have. Uh, having coached 22,000 runners, I would say that the number one thing people should focus on is improving their running economy and efficiency. Uh, that is so overlooked. You never hear a runner say, I'm going out to practice. They're all going out to finish their run, and they tend to be too quantitative. 
Uh, I was with Mark and Dr. Phil Maffetone a couple weeks ago in West Virginia, and I've totally changed my training approach. I think technology has been a blessing, and it's also been a curse because we go out and we have a specific pace, whether it's an interval run, a tempo run, that we want to accomplish, and we tend to focus more on where we are relative to our goal. But the reality is I have now taken the formula of 180 minus my age, uh, 60, so the number is 120. I don't exceed 120 in over 90% of my training runs. Now, when I first started doing that, my average pace went from 745 to 1045, and it seemed absolutely pedestrian, but Mark and Dr. Maffetone assured me that over time my pace would improve. So this morning I went out for a five-mile run along uh, Lady Bird Johnson Lake, and I kept my, my heart rate at 120, and my pace now is 905. So I'm, I'm moving back down in speed, but I'm keeping the level the same. So I think the lesson is we need to run slower in order to run faster. I think we also need to do a better job of listening to our bodies, and one of the best ways to do that is monitor your resting heart rate each morning before you get out of bed. Mine is 45, so I know that if, if I'm more than three beats higher than that, for some reason my body isn't well rested. It could be that I trained hard the day before, I didn't eat well, uh, I didn't sleep well, I might be dehydrated, but if I wake up with an elevated heart rate, I don't run. I do low impact or zero impact. Um, the zero runner from Octane Fitness, hopefully you all have an opportunity to see it and try it tomorrow. Completely zero impact, but it allows you to run with your natural movement. Um, independent knee joint, independent hip joint, you'll see me on it. My colleague Larry will be on it tomorrow. Hopefully you'll be able to try it. I'm doing about 60% of my total training volume with zero impact. And then the other, you know, the, 20, the next 20%, I'm on a true form curve treadmill. We all need impact. And then the rest I do outside. So I think, you know, listening to your body early in the morning, uh, first thing in the morning before you get out of bed, adjusting your training intensity and volume on that. I think also nutrition, uh, as I've gotten older, nutrition has become more and more important to me. Uh, Dr. Mark has, you know, has encouraged me to adopt a low-carbohydrate, low high-fat diet, drop 25 pounds. I don't think I've ever felt better. That's helped me. Another huge void, and I'll end on this, is most of us, when we finish a workout, we don't complete a comprehensive post-workout recovery routine, whether it's Generation You Can or just whatever. It could be chocolate milk. Uh, you know, Four, four parts carbohydrates to one part fat. I've gotten away from that completely, but I think for a lot of people that still works very well for them. So it's a very complex puzzle that can be very, very simple if you just follow those guidelines. We'll go on to the next question here. I'm going to ask a couple more, then we're going to open it up, up to y'all. But, you know, are runners totally committed to running exclusively now, or are y'all starting to see people more open to cross-training, you know, even amongst those people that are just <laughs> hardcore runners. So what do you think, Rob? What, what are you seeing um, there? I think people are more apt to try different things. Um, it's, you know, in some cases maybe getting them to try something different or get some exposure to it. Uh, I know from the Ellipticos, if, you know, we put them outside the store on a nice day, you'll just have people come in like, wow, what is, you know, just the intrigue factor alone. Um, does that. But I think as a population, we're just getting smarter and understanding that, you know, doing the same thing over and over again it doesn't necessarily work. And, you know, as Meb being a perfect example here, you know, making the Olympic team at 40 years old, I remember sitting in Austin three, four years ago, I think, and you were 38 at the time, and we were talking about various things, and Elliptical came up in a conversation, and he looks at me and he says, I'm going to make the Olympic team at 40, and it's because of the bike. And I'm like, wait a minute, okay, kind of tell me a little more about this. And he was 100% adamant that, you know, he wished, I think his exact quote was, I wish I had this 10 years ago. Yep. And I never forgot that conversation with him. So, you know, this is just a perfect example right here of somebody that had success with doing it. And I see it back home with some of my high school runners as well. You know, initially I bring out the elliptico and they're like, whoa, like, you know, I'm not riding that. What are people going to say? And then you get them on it. And, 
you know, our best girl this fall on the high school cross country team once a week at least is coming, you know, can you bring the bike tomorrow? Can we ride the bike? And so it does work and I think it's opening up our eyes to some various ideas to keep us healthier and better overall. So, Meb, you actually ride this thing out in general public, but are you seeing like the canyons now kind of covertly using these things, or is this unique to you, you know, at your level of running people using things like a lift to go or zero runner or other things, not just when they're hurt, but as part of their maintenance? No, I mean, I know the canyons probably don't have it. It's an advantage <laughs> that I have. Um, but how many would like to have a, you know, I have my Epson watch here, but a GPS watch, you know, would you like to have it a long time before it got invented? Absolutely. So uh, with the elliptical, it's the same thing. I think for me it was if I can stay healthy and consistent, I can produce results. But if I get injured, then I'm going to, you know, play catch up. And then when you play catch up, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to you're gonna get re-injured or you're going to make come back too fast and <coughs> call yourself into a problem. So. The elliptical, like Rob said, yeah, I mean, I said I wish this thing was around way before because I didn't go to Beijing in 2008. And if I knew I had that then, I could have potentially trained instead of try to come back too fast, try to make the 10K team, and I didn't make the 10K team, and I had to put a church crasher for the marathon. So I think um, I love riding in San Diego. I live in San Diego, so it's a year-round place. And uh, for those of you that are in a cold place, it's kind of hard maybe, and, but for me, I'll you know, I, I ride from my house, I go around Mission Bay Park, uh, Pacific Beach, and, and then climb up the hill. So sometimes you love going down the hill. It takes you about three minutes to get down. It takes you 15 minutes to get back up. But that's the beauty of it. And when I'm in Mammoth, in Mammoth Lakes in the wilderness, you know, I run into bears or deer and things like that. I don't know what they think about it, but <laughs> it's definitely it's getting me fit and, uh, and no, no impact whatsoever. I think that's the beauty of it. And, uh, and also, as a, we are type A personality, is to this day, I know I should have taken maybe like the last five years or so, maybe one day off, but I never done it because you think you got you missing out kind of thing. You think you're missing out, but having that a little go there, I think it's been an advantage for me just because I said no more evening runs. I'm just gonna go my lift to go instead of going for a 30 minute run or 35 minute run. I'll go for two hours on a lift to go, and you know people look at you. Uh, you know, what is that thing? And I guess the kids love it. And I'm like, what is that thing? Mom, Dad, can you give me one of those? I'm like, good. And we need to make a mini, mini elliptical for the young kids, you know. But uh, I think, it's a, you know, you are so tall and go on the boardwalk or in the streets, people just, you know, you know it's different. They want to have it eventually. And Rick, are you, are you seeing people more open-minded to doing other things, not just when they're hurt, but on the front end? I am. In your groups? <clears throat> I think. Runners obviously love to run, and it breaks my heart when I see people out there running with straps and all sorts of things to help them run. They love it so much, they're willing to risk their long-term health. I've always said a well-timed and much-needed rest day is as important as a great workout. And I think that's a good guideline for everyone to embrace. Uh, it's counterintuitive for a runner. Um, you know, I watch Meb all the time, and I. I try to figure out what, how is he able to run so fast? And you know, I, I use slow motion video and it's amazing how little contact time he has with the road. And I think that's the key to success. It's, it's running like a, a little old lady on a frozen lake. You, you don't wanna fall, you just wanna short stride, high cadence. And I tell my runners, imagine that you're running through puddles and you're trying to keep the splash to a, to a minimum. And if you're mindful of that, you're going to improve your running form and efficiency, as I said before. <clears throat> but having coached 22,000 runners, I understand them really well. I'll stand at mile 15 of the Boston Marathon every year, encouraging the 400 plus runners that I'll have in the race. And I know what each one of them is thinking. I've got 11 more miles to go. And they get to 16 miles, and they've got 10 more miles to go. And they're always living out there. And, in general, we're always living out there. We're living for the weekend, we're living for our next vacation, but it's right here that counts. And that's so true with runners. It's what you're doing now. Think of yourself, yourselves as an airline pilot. A pilot gets up to 35,000 feet where there's less turbulence and they start trimming the plane. We're no different. We get at that pace where we're really comfortable and we should, should start trimming. 
how, how we're carrying our hands like we're holding butterflies that are fluttering in our hands. Yet I see, and mostly women are guilty of this, they're like prize fighters. They get their shoulders up and tight, and then they cross their center line. And if you just go out and try to relax, run at an easy pace, and really enjoy running and be mindful of what you sound like, you're less likely to get injured. You're going to be more efficient. That's why I'm an advocate of taking regular walk breaks. You wouldn't go to a gym and get on a bench and try to do 30 consecutive repetitions. You might be able to do it, but the law of diminishing return kicks in after maybe 10. But if you take a break, let your heart pump blood carrying oxygen to your major muscles and do three sets of 10, that works perfectly. We should adopt that same philosophy for running. So yes, I see people, especially injured runners, they become the best students. They're more receptive to taking rest days and not running on consecutive days. And people my age, I, I really don't think it's a good idea to run on consecutive days. Uh, I've not tried the elliptical, but I'm certainly interested in it. Uh, you'll see me in the Octane Fitness booth with the zero runner. That's, I do 60% of my miles on that, completely zero impact. So I think that's going to help me extend my running career for hopefully as long as I'm alive. Rick, how is this for the puddle? <laughs> no? Not too good? No. As a, as a fellow coach, I help a lot of military people. So you said that there's 10 miles to go. Another way you could frame that in people's mind is there's nine and change. And then there's eight and change. Right. I don't know what Meb's thinking. When you see five, oh crap, five to go. But four and change sounds a little bit, little bit better. It does. Um, another question, just how, how do you all see like a, a running retail store being part of this? Because they come to us to learn about running, but there's bike stores and fitness equipment stores and, you know, different, you know, things out, you can go to department stores now and get stuff, but how, you know, uh, you know, we've got one retail owner, coach, and an, and an athlete, but maybe how do you see a retail store helping, whether it's education, having alternative products, do you see a, a growth in this area? I mean, I, I do, I think as long as you're open-minded to it, I mean, we sat here earlier and we heard a couple different lectures, and all week long you'll walk through the room and you're going to hear retailers around the country say, you know, I'm selling against Amazon, I'm selling against the big box guy down the street, I'm selling this and that. And at the end of the day, we are specialty and we're a niche and we're supposed to be as a retailer providing a service to the customer. Well, this is all a perfect example of you can't get an Elliptigo or I think a Zero Runner at Dick's Sporting Goods. You know, you can buy it directly from Elliptigo, sure, but if you want to come in and physically feel the product, try the product out, just get more information about it, where are you going to go? So from our perspective back in New Jersey, we have two locations and the bikes are there and like I said earlier, it'll bring people in off the street just curious what it is. Almost any time I take the bike out and go for a ride, three or four people will send an email to the Elliptigo site and, or call the store, hey I saw this guy on a, I don't know what it was, but what is it type deal. Um, so it's not, the nice thing is it's not a large investment, you're not tying up a lot of dollars on it, but it's a great way to get customers in, it's a great way to engage them in conversation, and I mean, I'm not going to kid you and tell you that every person that walks in the store and asks a question about an elliptigo buys the bike, but I can tell you over the course of, I think we've had the bikes now three years, there's some people that came in a year ago, two years ago, that now have done more research, have seen it a little more. Um, and they have come back and bought the bikes at different points. So I think in an industry where we're, I don't want to say we're trying to reinvent ourselves, but we're trying to find a way to keep ourselves relevant, keep us on the forefront of what's going on, this is a perfect example of something that's an opportunity uh, to do that. And we'll have customers, you know, it's not just people within five, ten miles of the store. We've sold bikes to people that have driven an hour, hour and a half and come up to get the bikes because fortunately for us right now, there, there's not a lot of guys carrying it. So Dave over there at Haddonfield, keep, keep resisting a little bit. We'll take the South Jersey customers up north with us. Um, but yeah, I think you should be open-minded to it, whether it's an elliptical, whether it's a zero runner, whether it's something else that's going to evolve next year, two years from now. You know, if we can do something that's different and separates us, what's the downside to it? I think they cost less than Springsteen tickets on Broadway. On Broadway they do, yes, you're right. They are cheaper than that. And what you tell people is, you know, it's like buying a road bike. 
but it's something you're going to have. You buy a gym membership, you keep paying that gym membership month after month after month. On an elliptico, you buy it, and it's yours. You own it, similar to a road bike. Yeah, there's a little bit of maintenance, just like a road bike. You may get a flat tire or something, but it's your product, and you keep it over a period of time. So, Rick or Meb, any role you see in like your local running stores with this? I'm in San Diego. Do any running stores carry, you know, zero runners or elliptigos? Have you seen? Um, I've seen the elliptical quite a bit. Uh, have seen the zero. My climate is, is uh, a good. But I think too. the bottom line is customer service. I mean, it takes a it takes a village to raise a child, and the run is our baby. So there's so many people local that want to be able to do, will want to get your product. And as long as you can have lectures or educate them and influence them in a positive way, I think runners are very loyal, personally. And uh, you want to be able to just, how do you get them to the store? Once they get to the store and show them that, hey, they've never done a 5K, they're going to do a 5K, 10K, half marathon to a marathon, take them to the journey. If you take them to the journey and the best satisfaction they can get is a customer service and thank you and they want to buy your product because you know, you know, whether it's the Skechers or any other shoe company that is there, it's the best, you know, the best shoe there is for them and they're going to come back and say, hey, I want to see Rob or I want to see that person who is in the store. You know, want to be, I done that when I was in high school. There's, I went to the local shoe stores and be able to buy them and things like that and I, I still like to do it. You know, it's just because that, for me, that Human interaction is priceless. And if you're there to tell them no, you know, because some of them are so nervous to come to your store, oh, I'm not a runner, I'm not a runner, I'm not a runner. And then when they come out, they're like, that was a cool experience. It's like, I can't wait to sign up for a 5K. And you want to do that magic for them. And once you do that, they're going to keep coming back and coming back and to a longer distance. And every time they run those 300, 400 miles on those shoes, they make sure they return to you. And, you know, I don't know what the secret is, but. You need to have a community or employee meetings and all those things so you can how do you attract those people and, and have fun. If you, they have fun, they're going to come coming back. Mebta, this is, you, you said this at the Air Force Marathon a, a year ago, and this was epiphanal. It says everyone should do one marathon and the rest is optional. Yep. So I think that's a good, you know, a lot of customers, they always want to have a goal. But I think everyone kind of always want, they want to, knock that off, do one, but then after that, we want to keep them healthy, because some people don't do that in a healthy way. They put a lot of hurt into their bodies. But Rick, any, th any thoughts on? I'll be brief so people can yeah, ask we'll go, questions. Go to the um, audience. I, I completely agree with Meb. I, I think um, it's all about customer service and creating uh, your store as a resource for people to come to, have fun, to learn, uh, to cultivate friendships. It's all about community and you know, the, the analogy of it takes a village to raise a child I think really resonates with everyone in the room. Um, on that level, I would just say if, if, if you could focus it on, on having someone on staff, maybe multiple people, who are really dialed in as coaches on improving running form and efficiency. And I'm going to be around for the next couple of days if you want to stop by the Octane booth and I'll share my contact information. But it's very, very simple. But if you teach people how to run efficiently and with greater economy, they're going to be less likely to get injured because if they get injured, they don't want to come to a store and be around people who are going out and running. The key is really to keep them injury free. Uh, and as Rob said on the elliptical side, uh, Zero Runner is just starting a retail program for the Zero Runner for stores like you. So I hope you'll stop by our booth. My colleague Larry is heading that up and you can learn more because takes a lot of shoes to make up that same margin that you can get by selling one zero runner. So I agree with Rob. You, you need to be open-minded. I would say get comfortable being uncomfortable. So be, get comfortable being uncomfortable. That's, that's where life is lived and that's where you're going to learn. So get comfortable being uncomfortable. Sounds like a marathon. Yes. We'll turn it over to y'all. Um, I think someone's circulating with a mic. If not, I can walk around. Somewhat of an easy question for you guys. So you talk about doing the proper warm-up, cool-down, drills, working on form. The average customer in the U.S. these days has about 30 minutes they can run, if that. A lot of them go, you know, 5 a.m. in the morning. How do you recommend them trying to do all these little things 
added things that would make them healthier when they only have 30 minutes? Do you tell them only run for 15, use the other 15 for that stuff? Our society now just nobody's got time and all the injuries we see, I see people get out of bed at 5, 5.05, they're out the door, they're running and they come home and they're hobbling because they're trying to cram it all in. So how do you tell someone with 30 minutes how to, to get everything in? I'll just give a real quick answer and then I'll, I'll, I'll let my uh, fellow panelists offer their insight. As a running coach, I look at all the data and 99% of the runners that I see, whether they're 30 minutes on their lunch hour before they go to work, their first mile is their fastest. Their last mile is their slowest. So rather than spending a lot of time, maybe a little bit of time doing some dynamic stretching, I would much rather they go out and run slow. By slow, I mean 60 to 90 seconds slower than they expect to average for the remaining miles. And then maybe spend five minutes, five to 10 minutes. So you're, you're talking about a 20 minute run out of 30 minutes, but that extra 10 minutes on post-workout recovery is going to pay much higher dividends than running for those 10 minutes. The worst thing they can do is just run for all that time and shut it down, not refuel, not rehydrate, and then just go on with their day. So I would just say start slow and then end with maybe five or 10 minutes at the end to do the post-workout recovery. How many of you guys heard saying, go that extra mile? Right, show of hands, go that extra mile. Well. I like to say, go one less mile. And then to what he just said, if you run 10 minute mile pace, why don't you use that five minute before, five minute after, where there's, I, I like to use it for stretching because hydration can be done in the car or whatever at work and nutrition can potentially be done there. But the four or five minute before four run, the Achilles, the calves, the hamstring stretch, and then a little bit the same thing afterward will give you consistency, longevity, and results. Because if he says, oh, I gotta run 30 minutes and, and you run 27 minutes or 28 minutes and then two minutes to shower and then go, it's not gonna work because I see so many people that they run, it breaks my heart. They run, they go straight to the car and take off. I'm like, I wish I could give them that one piece of advice, just use four minutes, you know, stay on the curve of the sidewalk, stretch the Achilles, the hamstring, the calves, and the quads. Three to four minutes, and then three to four minutes beforehand, you can have consistent training and have good results. So that's the, I think, word of uh, wisdom to be able to give, because it might be five minutes, but whether you run three times a week or four times a week, it adds up, and then it gives you the injury prevention, it gives you consistency, and then you will receive the results. Nice. I'll throw a couple of thoughts in too. So I'm 51 and I haven't had a running injury in about 20 years and this, this year will be my 31st sub three if I can pull it off, knock on wood. So your morning run starts the night before with a good night's sleep and you can't get ready in five minutes. So if someone thinks they can get up and be out the door in five minutes, you, they're wrong. <laughs> you know? So sometimes you just have to tell them they're wrong. You know, so I have a five to 10 minute mobility routine in the morning to get my creaky body at least mobilized to go run while the coffee's brewing. You know, have a cup of coffee. And I have a dog who's about nine years old and pretty slow now. So the first five to 10 minutes is with my dog. You know, come back, drop my dog off and go for a run. So I don't think if it's something valuable in your day, it actually is going to take more than a half hour. And I think George Sheehan said this, you're on the first half hour for fitness and the next half hour for your you. How many of you all are happier if you're out there an hour than a half hour for some reason? You don't know why. So sometimes it's, you just tell your customer, so, you know, yeah, you just got to go, you turn off your damn cell phone. You got to go to bed earlier. And if you just start getting up earlier and doing that, it actually invigorates you and gives you energy the rest of the day. So getting up that half hour earlier, you know, if you get a good night's sleep and you sleep well, gives you more energy because the goal is to have energy through the day. You know, the running is our leisure and the running's the relaxation so we can go through the rest of the day. But just sometimes turn things on their head and make it, you know, help and be empathetic with your customers to try to make it fit into their crazy busy life. Other quest questions back there? Or 
I'm just curious, we, with our runners, we use MEB as a particular example of this, but what do the three of you think the importance of core strength has to do with injury prevention, especially with older runners? I think core is pretty important. Uh, my coach, Ed Ramos from high school, always said 50 push-ups, 125 sit-ups. Until that's done, workout's not, it's not over. So I use that mentality personally to just, uh, I think being tall, been, you know, tall and mechanically sound system, you know, we know when you get fatigued, it's not, you know, we want to be relaxed. We want to be relaxed. How can we be? And you don't want to be, if you're doing half marathon, you don't want to be breaking down at six or seven miles. So you want to long as long as you can to mile 10 or 11. And in the marathon, the same way, mile 20, mile 23, you still want to be able to say mechanics, mechanics and stride, low uh, cadence, you know, you'll be able to just formulate your, your, your tunes. And those things happen in training. And I think whether it's push-ups or core workouts or, uh, you know, whatever that, that you think is going to help you. I mean, a lot, I talk a lot about metformortals, about neck exercises. You want to keep your head, most weight in the body is the head. So if you can keep that, I wear sunglasses to be able to just keep my, you know, erect eye level straightforward versus when you get fatigued, we go down, we look my whole head down. And that's, that's you know, it's going to over, overstride because it's going to arch our back or, you know, all those things are together. So you want to be able to just be tall and of course, a great way to be able to do that for me is uh, um, planks is a great way, sit-ups, push-ups, and then a little bit weights more for ligaments and muscles versus trying to get big. I, I think it's a great question, and I really focus on <clears throat> in, improving my runner's mobility, flexibility, balance, and core strength. You know, runners just want to run, and so they develop this big engine, and then they have a weak upper body or they have a weak core. And, that's analogous to shooting a cannon from a canoe. Uh, you, need a, you need a base of stability. So, um, you know, uh, that five minutes after a run, I, I tend to do my push-ups and my sit-ups and my core work um, in that time. And then I refuel and rehydrate. So I, I think it's extremely important, especially when we get tired if we're running marathons. If you, I, I, have, I have pictures of runners at the start of a marathon and pictures of them at the end. And the only thing I recognize is their clothes. Their, their, form, has, <laughs> their form has diminished so much. And, and then the other thing I see when they send me their finishing picture is they're shutting off their watches. You can't even see their number. I'm surprised they even get a uh, picture. So uh, I think core is so important. And it ranks a close second to what I've been talking about, improving running form and efficiency. I would tend to agree with Rick uh, tremendously on it. For me, even with the high school athletes that I coach now, without core, oftentimes you don't get to the running because something's going to break down. And how often do you see people out running or walking and they're crooked or their arms are up here or you know, they're hunched over this way? If you establish the core, essentially, you know, from above your knee up to about your chest, if that area is strong, those things don't happen and you're just that much more efficiently. I think I said earlier how I had back surgery five years ago and you know I would just hobble around and I was commenting this morning with my partner in the store. I picked up a pair of my shoes I'm like wow I'm not broken anymore because <laughs> the wear pattern's right back where it should be in the middle of a shoe whereas two years ago I was still banged up from the surgery and I was just all crooked and foot strike and everything else so I think if much like a tree you get that center part strong and stable it's going to go light years ahead for you with your running and sustain it over a period of time as well. So when do you do your core training? All day. How you stand, how you sit, and how you breathe the whole day is your core training. So if you're doing your 10 minutes of planks, but then you're sitting like this the rest of the day, you're really just wasting your time. So just be aware of that. You know, just uh, get off your... You guys are lucky because you're in a job where you're on your feet, but probably a lot of your high school classmates who are behind desks and cubicles, you know, their core breaks down just by the fact they don't have any gravity on their body all day. Other questions? We've got a few more minutes. Right, right in the middle in the of the room. There. Uh, my own here. Uh, ben McDonald from Fleet Feet Sports uh, Jackson. Uh, for Rick, uh, all of our training programs are group based uh, from walking a 5k to a half iron distance triathlon but from your perspective and experience what advice could you give us to 
to make our training programs more of a draw, more um, of a selling point, or to add value to the training programs, even though it's in a group setting, not a one-on-one -on -one coach to athlete experience? That's a great question. I, um, I'm training 400 runners, uh, could be 500 by the end of this week for the Boston Marathon uh, next April. And I do a group training program. I do one training program for everyone, and it's, it's mileage-based. So I think by doing that, that, that's the right approach. That's the core. You're going to appeal to more people that way. The, the X factor is some runners are going to finish that mileage sooner than others. But to really answer your question, I would say you're going to have that group of people that have a specific time goal in mind. And you might have to structure some different training programs for them, which is what I do. If they have a goal of uh, running four hours for the marathon, that's a goal marathon pace of 909, you're going to have to structure some tempo runs and some interval runs that are much faster than that. I take a very unique approach when I train people for marathons. Um, I'm not really an advocate of ever going beyond 20 miles uh, in a training run. I don't think it's necessary. In fact, I think it's very harmful or can be for most people. So what I will do is I will have them do a, a six mile run before a half marathon race. So they finish that six mile run at a very easy level as close to the starting line of the half marathon. So mile one of the half marathon is mile seven. Mile 13 is mile 19. So they're training their bodies to run faster when they're tired or later. And that's been a real successful approach to, for me and my runners. Uh, it's all about keeping them engaged and healthy. And I always say, the goal is, regardless of distance, to finish in relative comfort. And for, for those of you who run marathons, when people ask you, because inevitably the first question they're going to ask you is, did you win? And then the second question they're going to ask you is, what was your time? The answer should always be, it was the time of my life. And that silences all the critics. But uh, if I didn't answer your question specifically for you, I hope you'll track me down at the end or over the course of the next two days, and I'll give you some more information, OK? But great question. I helped with the team in training in Denver. Didn't have as many runners as Rick, but we really slowed them down and had them walk every mile. So if they finish those weekend long runs without being a complete disaster the rest of the weekend, they tended to want to come back. So we used heart rate monitors, you know, slow the F down is really what it was. But they had, and we had them walk, you know, we were on a trail that had a little mile post. And every mile post, walk a minute. And the data actually shares that in, unless you're running faster than a three hour marathon, most people will go faster and certainly with less pain if they walk about 30 seconds every, every mile. So just play with that yourself. Because somehow we're all like, we feel like we have to run the whole thing until we're driven to walk by our fatigue. But if you walk early and often, you know, then maybe you can smell the barn three miles to go and you can say, I'm just going for it. But that's actually a pretty good feeling if you're there. I also know that people run faster when they don't wear a watch. And it's really hard to get runners not to wear a watch, but the people that I coach have to sign a contract that they will not wear a watch in the race. A watch leads to inefficient pacing, and it burns fuel very inefficiently. Um, so not going with a watch and just running how you feel uh, is, is the best, best approach. And I'm actually moving away from like the Yasso 800s, the interval runs and tempo runs, and just running the majority of the runs at a low, anaer uh, low aerobic level so that you're actually burning fat rather than sugar. And then if you've got a goal, uh, a race in mind, then as you know, six weeks out from that race, maybe introduce a little more specificity. But in general, I think we are overtrained. I think we're running too fast too often. We need to slow it down. And I'm a, I'm a good example of that. And I owe it to Dr. Phil Maffetone and uh, Dr. Mark Cucuzella. I put a smile on my hand. That's, it. That's my watch, like where the watch should go. So unless you've got to catch a train or your plane, you really don't need the watch. I mean, do, do, you wear, do you wear a watch in your competitive races? I mean, even though you may have one, do you pay any attention to it? 
There's a little difference of uh, opinion on this one here. Yeah, so. no, that's what's good. I definitely wear Epson watch. He's got a nice, he's got a nice Every watch. Every race. Uh, as long as on the track, I never did, but on the road, I do, because if somebody makes a move, uh, if they ran 425, I'd rather know they ran, we ran 425 or four, five minutes, right. whatever it is, because you, they can't keep that up. If they run, we run five it minute really pace, they throw a 440, right. they know they're gonna go for two miles or three miles, so it tells your body, just hang in there, hang in there, because if I didn't have the watch, I wouldn't know. You'd, right. you'd go. And, <laughs> and then, <laughs> right, and then Hello. two, I think if you're running in a marathon where other people have done 10 marathons and your athlete or somebody else might do the first marathon, it can be a little bit because, you know, they don't know that's their 10th marathon and especially on a narrow road, they can start a little fast and especially like Boston is just a little downhill and it uh, can be a little bit of a trouble. And then for me, um, I do believe in a uh, little over 20 miles. I've done personally at 20, 26, 27, not that everybody needs to do it, but is time on your feet. At that point, really, I'm not worried about the watch, but I'm worried about covering the distance. Go out there, be on your feet for, rule of thumb is a minute per mile slower than race pace. Mm -hmm. So you're there, just say, hey, I'm gonna go 22 miles or 21 <clears throat> miles and things like that. You can stay there just on your feet. And, you know, it's, I think it's confidence builder to just say, you know what, I cover 23 or 24 miles, then I can do it on, on race day to finish the, uh, the rest of my lifetime or to you know, get that medal. So now you have done in training, you visualized it, and now you can go and execute a great, great plan on, uh, on race day. Be before we finish, I just want to share a real quick story about Meb. Um, I was near the finish line of the 2013 Boston Marathon when the bombings occurred and one of my good friends had just come out of the nearby restaurant having lunch with his mother and father. The first bomb went off and the father lost his leg that day. And the, the next year, Meb, Meb put the names of the four people killed in the corner, the four corners of his number that day. Little did he know that he would win that day. He was certainly hoping but if you see him crossing the finish line, Meb, you may not even know this, but there was a man and a woman holding the tape that you broke, and that was the mother and father of my friend. Wow. And he was without his leg. Um, my friend ended up dying from all the shrapnel, but what Meb did on that day provided so much comfort to that family. Um, you know, Meb gets a lot of credit for finishing uh, silver medal in the 2004 Olympic Marathon in Athens. Um, finished, uh, was it 12th? 2000, um, 2009 New York. 2009 New York, he won 2009 New York, he won 2014 Boston. But it's an absolute honor for me to be here with him because I literally travel the world and I've been running for 43 years and there's never been a, a greater ambassador for our sport throughout the world than Meb, the most humble runner I've, I've ever met. So <laughs> congratulations, thank you for everything you do. Appreciate it, keep all the great work you do with those guys. <clears throat> One more question, then we're going to turn it over to the movie, I think. Go, yes. This is more of a comment than a question. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. This is really more of a comment than a question, but relative to one of the earlier comments that what can we as retailers do to help our customers be healthier, uh, needless to say, what Meb experiences as a world-class athlete versus what Rick was talking about with not world-class athletes, okay? People who have jobs and families and, you know, different life situations. I think it's important to realize that you can't necessarily apply the same criteria and advice to everybody. So when you're dealing with customers in your stores, I think it's important to do what we do as customers anyway, get to know them and see what their individual situation is before you launch into 
you got to do it this way or you got to do it this way. Because they're going to listen to you. That's how much they look up to you. They're going to listen to you. They're going to believe everything you say. So I just wanted to comment that I think it's important to see where they're coming from and what their background is. I appreciate that. It's called, it's called empathy, where you just need to understand the person and their lives and what their challenges are. And, um, but yeah, we'll, Mark, yeah, we're wrapping up. Yeah, it's certainly been a privilege for me, too, to have three friends up here and certainly to uh, have met here as an honored guest. You know, probably go down in history with Frank Shorter, Bill Rogers, as one of the no greatest doubt. marathoners in, in no history. Doubt. And, uh, you know, I've heard a lot of people speak and engage with crowds, but Meb is probably the most gracious person I've seen, you know, amongst whether it's retailers, Air Force members, you know, so it's, it's great to have you here, Meb. Thank and, you. And uh, have a great few days.